But go to 2 Peter 3 for some of you who want to take a look at it. God's clock system of his coming, his coming, right? They were waiting for his coming, so God gave them a clock. So then he gave them a clock that a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. So then this is how it went. So then we went from 4,000 B.C., then 3,000 B.C., then we went to 2,000 B.C., and then 1,000 B.C., and then zero over here. And then 1,000, and then 2,000. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven here, all right? Two, three, four, five, four, five, six, and then seven. Remember, we came down through this, then basically the millennium should have hit it from here. The seventh day is when he rested, when all of creation is at rest. Remember that? So then during this 1,000 year millennial reign of Jesus Christ, this should have been it over here. So then you notice we're not too far away from uh, the coming of the Lord. It should be really, really close. The only reason why that uh, we're at the year 2020 is because our calendars are off. So the calendars is such a complete mess. So it's only a matter of time. I mentioned to you it's possibly. Now so many onliners misunderstand this, okay? So I, I want to make this very clear, okay? I mentioned to you before that it could be where we're already past it or or we have 200 years left. But we're either already past it or we have to wait for 200 more years. Some even say that it's going to be within two years. So people are thinking that Gene Kim says that we have to wait here 200 years longer and then Jesus is going to come. I never said that. So a lot of onliners, they just get very sensitive and then they mishear things quite often. So you got to understand this is that I'm saying that uh, the range is going to be somewhere between 200 years. That's the range. So it could be next year. It could be even today. All right. But I don't see anything longer than 200. So that's the range. It can go anywhere. Some of them show that uh, we're already past it, actually, that we're already past it. Why? Because there's so many different calendars how they do it. But anyway, aside from that, the point is, is that over here, this is where we're supposed to be. Did you notice that the Bible says... In the book of Genesis chapter 1, the evening and the morning was the what? First day, sun, moon. Evening, morning, second day. Evening, morning, third day. Evening, morning, fourth day. Evening, morning, fifth day. Evening, morning, sixth day. What? God rested on the seventh day. He doesn't say evening and the morning were the seventh day. It says the seventh day he rested. Why? This is supposed to go on for eternity. That's because why? That's God's time right here. God's time here at seven, it's rest for eternity. That's why no night there. Uh, neither is there any need of the sun and the moon. Sun and moon, morning, evening, morning, evening. No, over here it goes on endlessly. That's real good. Bless God. Amen. Yeah, that's real good over there. So over here, we hit the peak of eternity with God forever and ever. And then you can really sing the hallelujah chorus, and that turns out to be true. And he shall reign forever and ever. So for all eternity, we see over here, it goes on endlessly. There is no evening and morning. It's God rested, and we're going to rest with him for all eternity over there. That's real interesting stuff. Now, that's why 2 Peter chapter 3, when you read that text, it mentions the day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years, one day. 
So that's how God's clock and system will work. We're not too far away, church. We're not too far away. All right, the next thing you want to notice in that text <clears throat> is that that's why it says at verse 5, it goes on how long? Forever and ever. See? So that's why at verse 5, I'm commenting over here. In verse 5 over here, there's no where it goes evening and morning, evening and morning, and then the universe keeps aging and aging. No, uh, aging stops over here. Over here, according to verse 5, reign forever and ever. <clears throat> now, one of the interesting things is that if they reign forever and ever, and then the servants are serving him, did you recall where I mentioned to you that God divided off the universe into 12 parts? And then he divided the, the timing and the seasons where they visit the tree of life uh, 12 months in a year. So now the question in everyone's minds is, who are those 12 Gentile parts, Pastor? So the 12 Gentile parts is really hard for me to tell. The only way that I can tell it is when you look at geographically speaking, uh, when you look at uh, their history, and then you look at the genealogical roots. And then if you're going to collectively divide it into 12 parts, Dr. Ruckman puts it at this way. He divides the 12 parts in the following manner. Number one is North America. Number two is Central America. Number three is South America. Number four is the Antarctic continent. Number five, the Arctic Circle. Number six is Asia. Number seven, Africa. Number eight, Australia. Number nine, the West Indies. Number 10, the East Indies. Number 11, Greenland. Number 12, Europe. So uh, he's not 100% sure either, but some of these divisions he believes it's definitely going to happen. The other parts he's not too sure. My suggestion where you can, it can help with your research is find out why people who do geography, they divide it to seven continents. If you study their logical, their rationale for dividing that way, it might help you when you study about what would be the 12 best departing lines then? How God would do it. So that's my advice. That could be very helpful. <clears throat> Alright, so let's read some more over here. Verse 6 says, And he said unto me, So notice that uh, the angel is speaking to John, These things are faithful and true. So everything that is said, what? The promise of verse 5, uh, verse 3, verse 2, chapter 21, all those beautiful things that you've heard about. All these things are faithful, so it will have to happen no matter what you say. All right, you can scream global warming, we're all going to die, but guess what? You're wrong. God is, God's universe is going to go on endlessly forever and ever, and we're all going to live happily ever after. So don't let a bunch of screaming liberals scare you of your bliss and joy in the Lord of enjoying His creation. All right, so it's going to be faithful and what? True. So that means it's real, all right? It's not a fairy tale. I, it's so amazing how many scientists, they accuse us of being a negative pessimist when scientists are the biggest pessimists themselves. We're all going to die. Heaven, it's a comforting thought, you know, it's, it's a band-aid for religion, but it's not real, it's a fairy tale. You know, they're the negative pessimists right there. They're the negative pessimists. So, <clears throat> I mentioned to you at verse 6, this is going to be important for you to know. He said to me, is the angel. Now, there's going to be confusion because I was confused too. Because it seemed like from our previous verses at chapter 21, chapter 22, God was the one who was speaking. Remember that? A lot of times God was speaking, saying this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen. But then there's an angel who's speaking too, so then we're like, who's who over here? That's what's going on. So then, uh, verse 6, we can see this will be the angel, because keep reading, and the Lord God of the holy prophets send his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. We see that here. Now let's say that is the angel, let's say. Then verse 7, 
that can't be the angel. Behold, I come quickly. We know that's referring to Jesus him saying that. Jesus saying, I'm coming quickly. So then verse 8, then John bows down before the angel who showed him these things. So then now there's so much confusion. Who's the angel and who is Jesus, right? So then how does this work? Well, you got to recall back by context, chapter 21. Verse 9, notice that the angel is speaking at verse 9. You notice that? The angel was the one that said, uh, come and I will show you show you things. So then he carried him, but what the angel did was this. Remember John, he's somewhere at this timeline at the Isle of Patmos. And at the Isle of Patmos, John was carried where? In the spirit. Which Timeline. He was going through a time machine here. He was on the Lord's Day. And remember, that was referring to the entire tribulation timeline there. The entire book of Revelation. So here's the idea. Notice that if he was carried in the Spirit to the Lord's Day, you'll notice that at chapter 21, the angel spoke to him at chapter 21, verse 9. We read that. Verse 10, he carried him away in the spirit. Okay, so then it's actually more simple than you think. This is how it works. The, the angel went to John, carried him in the spirit, and showed him everything, like a picture, a TV screen, a revelation, a vision. That's what revelation is, see? Of everything that's happening. And in this TV screen, John sees, basically, see God speaking. That's why there's an intermingling of angels speaking and, and God speaking. That's the idea of chapter 21 and chapter 22. The reason why is because the angel's carrying him into this TV screen, so to speak, and then showing him uh, what, what the character, so to speak, is saying, and one of them is God, obviously. Why? Because they're in the Lord's day over here, and God is speaking in eternity there. Does that make sense? So that's why there's this... Um, confusion and intermingling going on of the angel speaking and then Jesus speaking back and forth and you got to realize this is that how the Word of God is built is not like how we uh, modern day human beings systemizing things like he said she said the next character said this no in God's biblical word uh, they feel like there is no need for that division over there there's no need for that division they just keep talking Sometimes you heard some preachers, if they preach really fast or they're in the spirit, they won't give a division of who said this or, he, or the other person said this. They'll just all make it into one flow so that they can carry that, um, not that spirit, but that motivation, that inspiration, that power in the preaching. So um, let me give an example. So then let's say I'm giving a dramatic illustration of the devil and God going back and forth against your soul. I'm not going to keep saying the devil said, and then Jesus said, the devil said, Jesus said. No, sometimes to make it more dramatic or more authoritative, I would say, I would sometimes not introduce it that way. I would say, I would start out probably by saying, the devil said, well, Gene Kim's soul is mine, I'm going to have him burn in hell. But then Jesus said, no, I died for that soul, so he's not going to burn in hell. But you said, God, that he would be mine forever. But when I eternally secure him, then he is mine forever. Now, you notice that I didn't mention like Jesus said, the devil said all the time. Why? Because it ruins that flow, that authority. Yeah. So the Bible is an authoritative, powerful book. So it wants to carry that whole flow of that idea about what's happening in eternity here. Behold, I come quickly. The Lord God will show you these things and all that. See, it's carrying that flow.